Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. This is part two of the Atari 520ST series. I don't know how many parts there's gonna be, and if you haven't seen part one already, I recommend you go watch that first, since I'll be just picking right up where we left off with this machine. It was donated, it's not working, and I wanna try to troubleshoot what's wrong with it. So without further ado, let's get right to it. Okay, so at the end of part one, I had left off with the 520ST not working, it was just a white screen. I had removed the RAM expansion board from it, and that didn't seem to do any help when it came to the machine not working. Now I had theorized that I probably needed to re-enable the memory because I thought that when you have a RAM expansion board, you probably need to disable the onboard memory to do that, and I had noticed a couple little changes on the board. I went and I found the manual for the RAM expansion board, which has the installation instructions, which explains exactly what you need to do. Here's a section on turning off the memory banks. But the funny thing is, is this manual actually says that this board is not compatible with the 520ST, specifically because it doesn't fit inside the case. Probably is the reason why all that hot glue was used to hold this in. And they had removed the RF shield that would have been on this machine originally to get it to clear the case. The later machines, I think, have a little bit more space inside. So you can actually put that board in there with the RF shield and everything when it's all together. But going back to the manual here, this is the instructions on the mod, but it doesn't even tell you what you need to do for the 520ST. It only talks about the STFMs, the 520 and the, the 1040 versions of that, along with the Mega 1ST, I guess, whatever that is. So on these other machines, you have to snip some resistors, which basically disconnects the RAM chips from the select lines to, on the memory management chip and then you have to connect them to five volts, which you find on this capacitor here. And that's actually the only mod because it, now it's going back into how to reassemble the machine. So I need to figure out what these mods are on this computer so I can undo them just to make sure this machine can work without the RAM board. So I have the motherboard on the bench here and I started taking a look at what might be modified. Incidentally, if you remember from the first video, there were some hot glue stuck on some of these chips here from where the board was glued down, and I did remove that. On previous videos, people had recommended using IPA to dislodge the hot glue, and I hadn't actually tried that trick. It really, really worked well. I just lifted the corner up a little bit, just put a couple drops of IPA, and it came right off. Anyway, this chip right here is the memory management unit. This has had that board plugged into it, and this is the video shifter chip, I think it's called, and that had a little board plugged into it as well. Here's the 512K RAM on this original motherboard. And when I was working on this machine the first time, I noticed that there were these little wires here that were installed there, and there is another one installed right here. And I'm pretty sure that this is part of the mod here to disable all the onboard memory. It turns out that pin 15 on this type of DRAM is the chip select line, and when you hold that high, it has the effect of disabling all of these chips. Now you might be asking, why is it only attached right here and right here? Well, that's because this is two banks of 256K, and those chip select lines are paralleled because there are eight chips that make up the 256K. Each one is one single bit. Well, it turns out on the Atari ST, each bank of memory is only 8 bits wide, which is a bit surprising because this is a 16-bit machine. I would have thought the RAM chips were hooked up through data bit 0 through 15, which would have been all 16 bits to the processor. But it seems that's not the case, and there's actually 8 bits per bank. Maybe Atari did that originally to support the 256K version of the Atari ST that they thought they were going to make originally. Let's just check to make sure that this side of these uh, bypass caps here is the five volt side. So one side's gonna be five volt, one side's gonna be ground. It's definitely not the ground. <laughs> that would be this side over here. That implies that this is definitely five volts, which I can find on this large cap right here. So yep, those are being pulled high. So this RAM is disabled. Now before shooting this video, I actually did some sleuthing around on the board to see if anything else was modified. And I did find one other thing. 
You may have already noticed that I made a couple marks on the board. There's one right here and there's one right here. Now I can see that there are traces cut here and here. Now this trace right here, I think leads from the chip select line and goes up to this via here, which almost certainly makes its way over to the memory management chip. And that's the chip select line for this bank. And over here, it's gonna be exactly the same thing. It goes from that via up to this via and the trace is cut. So to re-enable this RAM, I need to do two things. I need to lift this line right here and here. That is basically pulling the chip select down to ground. So that frees it. And then I just simply need to add a bodge from this via to one of the pins on the chips, or the, the pin 15 here, and the same thing over here from this via to there. And I'll do that on the back of the board. Um, that way it's not so obvious. And I'm actually just gonna remove this five volt jumper uh, entirely on this board on the top side. And when I wanna re-disable this RAM, I'll do it properly on the bottom of the board. With the two jumpers removed, I'm gonna use some braid and just get this big blob of solder off the chip. And a little bit of isopropyl alcohol to clean up this mess. Also, it's gonna take off that marker where I drew on it. And a quick inspection, I'll just look at this at an angle to make sure that nothing is bridged. First, I'm gonna validate that this via is indeed connected to the chip select line. And it is indeed. So it's going from there up to there somewhere. Let's figure out which one of these. Oh, there it is. There it is. So it's uh, the third pin over. Let's flip this over and look at, oh, look at that. Crisscross criss pattern. On these PLCC sockets, these are completely unusual and different, how annoying. Well, because it's a third pin over from this side, if I flip it over, that would imply to me that it's this pin here. That's the third pin, one, two, three. So I need to go from there to the chip select line on the RAM. So I decided to go from the via and not pin 15 because I stuck the bodge in there. And we'll just connect this up to the pin three that I hope it is. And over here, it's the via that will be just to the, what I guess, right of this hole here, going to that pin right there. So that's this via right here going to that pin right there. It's a very short little bodge wire that I need. And there we go, there's the bodge installed. All right, it is now time to check my work. So this pin here should be pin three here. And it is indeed. It goes from there up to here. Yep, okay, good. So that seems right. And then there's the cut that goes between this via and this pin on the chip. And there we go. So I'm gonna say that the RAM is re-enabled at this point, and I guess it's time for testing. Before I turn this on, I had several comments on part one to say you have to have a keyboard connected on an Atari ST or it won't boot. Well, we know for sure that there's no way this computer could have booted um, without the RAM expansion installed because the RAM was disabled. So there's no way that would have worked. But I haven't tested this now that I put those bodges in and undid the mod. So I'll plug the keyboard in and we'll see if this actually works. And now if it does, I'll, I'll test to see if it works without the keyboard. I've never run into a, a relatively modern machine. I mean, this is from the mid eighties here, but it's a 16 bit computer that required the keyboard to be connected for it to even boot. But perhaps I'll be proven wrong at this point. So let's see, the monitor should be warmed up. Cables are connected, let's turn it on. So, so far, uh, as we can see, nothing is happening. It's um, just a white screen as well. 
Uh, it's possible that without the disk drive connected, it's sitting there looking for a disk, which it's not going to find, obviously. Some people thought that you had to have the drive connected for it to work. I don't think that's the case because on my 1040 STE, I definitely have booted that computer without any floppy drives hooked up at all because the internal drive on that machine is bad. And I have a GoTech in there when I was working on that. I booted with nothing and it just shows the green desktop with no disk drives. So I'm going to let this sit for a while and see if anything changes here. All right, a bunch of time has passed and as you can see, it still has a white screen. It's definitely not running. Um, there is a power LED on the keyboard, so I know the keyboard is getting power. It is connected correctly. The connector is keyed on the keyboard, so you can't reverse it. Oh, incidentally, I had at least one comment where someone thought that one of the ROM chips was installed one set of pins off. But that's not the case. This top socket here is actually offset from the rest of them. So at quick glance, it makes it look like maybe there's a problem. I think at this point, it's time to bust out the logic probe here because I could do that over here. I don't have the oscilloscope handy. Um, and I'm gonna check the chip select line on those RAM chips just to make sure that there's some activity actually happening because if there's nothing, then that would imply this machine is frozen. A couple people thought that maybe it was stuck in reset because the reset button doesn't seem to do anything. So that's a good test. You can really do a lot of testing with the logic probe. All right, I'm gonna shut this off and I'm going to remove the keyboard just for easier access to everything. For the logic probe here, it has two leads and the easiest thing is just gonna be connect onto this capacitor here. And I'm gonna power the computer back up again. So to test the logic probe is working, I'm just gonna to touch it to the ground here. And that's gonna give that tone and then five volts will be this, which is a higher pitch tone. So I know there's um, a voltage and this thing is actually working. And let's hit the chip select line. That is the sound of activity. Let me hit the reset button. Well, reset doesn't seem to do anything, which is weird because I would think hitting reset should actually cause that activity to stop. Let's check this one here. We also have activity. Seems to me that the reset switch or button on the back here, it doesn't work. So I'm just gonna quickly grab the multimeter, just double check that there's actually a functional button there. All right, I did a little sleuthing and looking at the schematics for this board and uh, checking over on the bench, this reset switch is definitely working fine. The way the circuit works is it feeds this 556 here, and then this is the, uh, what is this, 74LS05. Uh, the output of the 555 goes into this, and this is what generates the reset. And I put a couple marks on the chip here where these are the outputs that are affected. And if we go right on here and we turn the power on, it's low then high. And the reset button is definitely working properly. I did check to make sure that that reset signal is making its way to the reset pin on the CPU and it is indeed and it's behaving correctly. So I think the next thing to try on this board now that I know the reset circuit is absolutely working perfectly is to check with the logic probe the data and the address lines on the CPU. Let's see if the CPU is actually executing any code. Quick Google search of the 68,000 pinout, which I'm just gonna place here under the monitor so I can uh, see what's what. So over here on this end of the chip, I have it oriented to match pin one to pin one. We have the data lines. Over on this end of the chip here are some of the address lines. In fact, this whole side of the CPU is data and address lines. So with the probe touched to data line four, let's hit the power. Okay, so that line is just uh, high all the time. So is the one next to it and the one next to it. Let me hit the reset button. Okay, it goes low when the CPU is in reset, but otherwise, it, uh, okay, there we go, that started correctly. You heard it, it was low for a second and then went high. I wonder why I didn't do that on this pin the first time. Interesting, that particular pin is just high all the time. That is data line four. Well, that's interesting. Okay, the probe is on address line four. And that's just high. 
and it really, unless I push the reset button, I don't hear anything happening. If the CPU were trying to execute code, the address lines would be toggling, as would the data lines. They wouldn't just be solid high. And on this particular logic probe, it does a kind of a beeping sound, like a dee 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 dee. That's the normal sound of, of a processor that's actually doing something. But this processor definitely just appears to be kind of dead in the water. Now, without checking the schematics, I want to just see quickly if that data line 4 is connected directly to the RAM, or that if some of this glue logic is actually in between the RAM and the CPU. I have a feeling it's going to be in between. So I have the multimeter set for continuity. A quick Google search of the DRAM pinout shows that pin 2, which is right here, is actually the data line. One of these chips is going to be on data line 4 on the CPU. So we'll touch it to that pin right there, just double check the multimeter. Yep, it's in continuity. And let's just go through these chips here. Let's see if any of these are actually connected directly to the CPU. And they are not. Now, there's a couple latches here. I wouldn't be surprised if one of these is in between. Yep, and there it is. So this latch here to 74LS373 is uh, connected directly to the CPU. And I wouldn't be surprised, let me just go on this chip here, that one of these pins on here is hooked up to the RAM. And there it is right there. And the reason why they're using these latches is because, as I mentioned before, eight of these chips is only eight bits wide. And really, this, this processor needs 16 bits. So I bet these latches are used to load 16 bits of memory at a time into the two buffers, so to speak, in these latches, and then load that into the CPU. Now, it goes without saying that just looking at the schematics, which are available for this machine, would have revealed the way this is all hooked up. But it's kind of interesting to figure that out. Uh, say you're working on a machine that has no schematics. I think these are skills that are useful in that case. Either way, for sure, one of these two chips is connected to all 16 data bits to the CPU because the original RAM expansion board that was in here was connected to the data bus somehow, and it was only really plugged into the two sockets here of these two chips. I'm probably guessing that it's the graphics chip that's actually connected to all 16 bits and that this one is handling all the chip select logic that is selecting which banks are active and whatnot. So I know this latch is what's connected to this chip's data bus line. There's that pin right there. Now I'm just gonna be curious to see if I can find that pin on this graphics chip here. Let's just quickly check that. There it is, it was right there. So basically this chip is on the shared data bus with uh, the RAM here. So plugging in that RAM expansion board into this chip here would also have the same effect of connecting those SIMs into the same data bus as these RAM chips, which would mean these latches still come into play when it comes to hooking the RAM up to the CPU. Now, I'm not nearly as familiar with the 68000 as I am with the 6502, and I don't know if the 68000 requires a little bit of RAM to do anything at all. Like, could it, could it execute code directly out of ROM? Although now I think about it, these ROM chips, which are 8 bits each, may also be sharing the data bus with the RAM and also require these latches to work. Well, let me probe the pin on the CPU and see if any of these pins on this ROM chip are connected directly to the CPU. So these chips are definitely connected with some kind of a, a glue or a buffer in between. Let's check these latches over here. Yep, there it is. These chips also are going through the latch there. Yeah, it seems like these three chips go through this latch chip and these three bottom chips go through that one. Anyhow, okay, so we know for sure that um, if these were faulty, if one of these were faulty, I think that would definitely stop this machine in its tracks. So it's a possibility. I'm definitely not saying that this is the fault right now, but it's definitely a possibility. Before I really dig deep into this machine and start removing chips and whatnot, I want to try one thing, and it's this. I have gone ahead and borrowed an Atari 1040 ST from another YouTuber here in Portland who has a little channel called Tales of Weird Stuff. This machine is untested, so um, we're going to have to test it first to make sure it even works. 
but architecturally the 1040 ST and the 520 ST here are so similar, I think I can take some of the main custom chips that are in sockets off this machine and put them in here and see if that brings this machine to life. And that of course is only if this computer is actually working, which we don't know yet. I'm going down this road because a couple people have told me that the MMU chip in the Atari, which is completely essential for this machine to do anything, can go bad. And when it does, you get the white screen symptom that we're seeing here. Now, please keep in mind, this is stuff that was told to me. I've never repaired any Ataris before. So if you have an opinion that those chips never go bad, then feel free to comment on that. But I'm just relaying what I have been told. And here's the Atari here. It's a lot bigger than the 520 because of course this has a built-in disk drive and I'd say it has a built-in power supply as well. And there it is, the 1040 ST in all its glory. And <laughs> it's really a heavy computer. The weight difference between the 520 and this is staggering. But I can tell you that this machine is gonna have all of its RF shielding installed, at least judging by the weight. Plus that power supply and floppy drive just, you know, adds the extra poundage to it. Condition of this machine is pretty good though. It's got minimal yellowing, a little bit, but not too bad. Of course, this is a later machine, so it has the connections for the mouse underneath here. On this side here, we have the MIDI ports and the cartridge port. And on the back of the machine, it's very similar, except for the IEC mains input for the power supply. It does not have an RF modulator, so this is not the FM version with the floppy and the modulator. This is just the STF, I guess, for internal floppy. And over here on this side, you can see the internal floppy drive. And what is this all about? It's got the actual shipping disk installed. Wow, that's uh, definitely interesting. Judging by the wear on the keyboard, there's a little bit of shininess from where people have typed on it, but it's a lot less worn than this keyboard here <laughs> on the 520. This thing has got really shiny keys, so it was used quite a lot. All right, you gotta remove this before you power it on because that will jam the disk drive. Monitor is connected and powered on. Let's see what happens. All right, well, hey, we saw a little bit of activity at least, so that's a good sign. It looked garbage-like, but it has cleared, so I would almost think, oh, the floppy drive is trying to access. So I'm gonna say this computer is about to boot. We should be getting that green screen momentarily. And there it is, it's working. So this is great news. That means that this machine should have some chips in it that I can test with. So yes, awesome. All right, here's the 1040 motherboard removed from the case. Uh, yeah, there was a lot of RF shielding and things and uh, stuff like here's the power supply and the floppy drive that was in there. Everything is really uh, clean and nice inside. This thing was barely dirty. I mean, look at this, looks brand new. I did tilt up the RF shield. You can see it right here on top of the graphics chip or shifter, I think it's called. Uh, and as you notice, this machine also, there it is. That's where the RF modulator goes and it's not installed. All right, so on the 520, and these are the two chips that were underneath the RAM expansion boards. And I really do suspect it could possibly be the MMU here, which is 912-38. And on this board, 912-38 is this lower chip here. This one here looks like it is 91, either six or five dash 38A, uh, which matches right here, 915 dash 38A. So that's the one that was not removed on my board. It was this one and this one. So I'm gonna pop this chip out carefully and I'll probably pop the one out of my board, this one right here, and I'll install mine into this working motherboard. And I wanna see if uh, it actually works in this chip, in this board, I mean. That will quickly rule out any issue. And I am using a chip puller, and it's a new chip puller. Uh, the one I was using was always having problems, like it was bent or something. This one, on the other hand, worked very easily uh, in this socket. So I threw the other one away. Not good quality, the ones you get from China. <laughs> All right, and then this chip right here is the one from my machine. In fact, before I push it in there, I'm just gonna draw a little dot on it so I can easily tell them apart. Okay, there it is, pushed back in. And here we go, let's give this a quick test. Just careful with this power supply, it's got mains live on it, of course. So if you notice when I turned this on, it was just right to a white screen. 
and we didn't have the bit of garbage that showed up on the original machine when it was working, which then cleared away. And I had mentioned earlier that some of my viewers had said that the ST will not work with the keyboard connected. So why don't we turn this off and I'm gonna reconnect this keyboard, which incidentally has just a few pins on the connector compared to the one on the machine, uh, the 520, which has far more pins and almost looks like a Commodore connector. And because the motherboard is bigger, I'm gonna take this uh, mouse pad here and put that under the keyboard. So it's absolutely not touching anything on the motherboard. And why don't we plug in this disk drive while we're at it as well. So that just has little standoffs and sits right there. Okay, here we go. And this has been sitting for a while and there's no floppy drive activity and there's no nothing. This is dead in exactly the same way as the 520. So I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say that that MMU is bad. So the next thing to try is put the MMU from this machine that we know works into the 520 ST, see if it comes to life. So here is the MMU from the 1040. Let's just pop that into the socket here. Push down straight. 520 ST ready for testing. And I did hook up the keyboard because everyone said that needed to happen. Here we go. Oh, I saw a little glitch there with the red and the, the blue, which is very much what was happening on. Look at that. Look at that. There we go. <laughs> a dead MMU. Oh, dead MMU. All that troubleshooting, it was that, that damn chip. Okay, uh, now I'm gonna turn this off and we're gonna pull the keyboard off and we'll see what happens without the keyboard since everyone was very adamant that it needed the keyboard to work. Whoa, I think that's what they said would happen if the keyboard wasn't connected. So sure enough, it's, it does cause that beeping but obviously the machine is uh, booting no problem just with this horrible beeping. And unfortunately, the volume knob on this monitor is frozen, so I can't turn it down. Let's turn that off. Yeah, the, the volume knob on the uh, monitor is uh, has frozen. I think I unfroze it and it refroze. Only the contrast knob is working. But the computer clearly boots perfectly without the keyboard. So just for everyone who, who swore up and down that you had to have this to boot, it's not quite the case, but of course you got that horrible beeping, which I assume is the, the same thing of, of like holding down a key like uh, if it has a stuck key, it would probably make that beeping sound. But this machine so far is functional at this point. I mean, I can't run full diagnostics on it because I don't have a diagnostic cartridge, but it's definitely booting into the gem desktop. I put the original working MMU back in the 1040 and I just want to test to see if it works. Uh, uh oh, uh, that's not good. What happens when I push the reset button? Blanks the screen, but... <laughs> oh no. What happened here? I guess I can hook up the keyboard. Well, that made no difference. The keyboard has a power LED, so it's definitely getting power. Oh boy. Did the MMU just die? Like it was working perfectly in the 520, put it back in its original machine, and now it's no good? By the way, with the 520 here and I have the MMU removed entirely, if I turn on the computer, you get nothing. You don't get, a, you get no video signal whatsoever without the MMU installed. All right, so this is the 1040 MMU that was working in this machine before I took it out. So let's see what happens here. I think it's gonna boot. Oh, so annoying. Look at boots, it works. So that other machine has another fault, an unrelated fault now. So unreliable, like what's happening here? Oh. All right, I have the 1040 working again. Yeah, there we go. Over on the bench, all I had to do was just sort of push down on the socketed chips and then it started working again. So one of them must have been slightly loose in there. And there's that bright green gem desktop on the 1040. Thumbs up. All right, the STE is all back together and I did hook up the mouse that was included in the box and that works nicely. I'm gonna try loading some software on this thing really quickly. First, I'm gonna clean the disk drive. So I have my cleaning disk here. Stick this in here. 
Let's try opening up the A drive. Sounds like the floppy drive is working completely normally, which is great. All right, that should have helped the heads if they were dirty. All right, I've copied a couple utilities onto this 720K disc here. It's formatted on a PC, but I'm pretty sure the Atari ST can read uh, MS-DOS or FAT discs. And yeah, there it is. Okay, so a couple things I've copied on here. Sysinfo.prg, which I think is a system information program. I do apologize for filming the screen. I don't have a way to plug this into my open source scan converter at this time. I need to make a cable. So this system information screen does give us a little info on this machine. This is the 1040 STEF, uh, the one from Ian. So eight megahertz, TOS version 1.0. Uh, I didn't even take a look at the chips that were in there. You know, they didn't have stickers on them. So there were six of them. Could those be original chips? The date codes on various things in this machine were from 1986 but this shows something from 1985. Over here with the memory, it does show the total RAM on this machine is 1024K, which is as we would expect, because this is a 1040, right? Looks like I right clicked and gave us some more stuff on here. I wonder if anything else is interesting. Application info, function keys, not available with this TOS version. Requires 2.05 or higher. Not really sure what else to click in here, so I'm just gonna hit quit. I have something called yet another RAM test or YART, something like that. Let's run this. I should be able to do a full RAM diagnostic on this machine. Yet another Atari RAM test. Press any key to start testing. I'm gonna push the space bar. Okay, I stepped away and it looks like it's run three passes and it shows errors zero, which is great. Ian is gonna be pretty pleased that his 1040 STF, gotta add the F there for the floppy, is working really well. I can't seem to find any issues with it and I just gave it a quick wipe down. And other than the very slight yellowing on some of these keys, this machine looks mint. So there we have it. The 520ST was killed by a bad MMU chip. And a huge thanks to Ian for letting me borrow his 1040 ST F with the floppy drive. So I could see if uh, this chip was the culprit, which I had a couple people let me know that when that chip dies, that's what you get. They get the white screen. And as you saw, sure enough, that was the only problem with this machine. So once I get a replacement MMU, which I need to go find, I'll be able to restore the mods required to put that memory expansion back in this thing. Then I need to see if that floppy drive is working properly and I'll give the case a full on clean and an eventual retrobrite. One of the issues is here in Portland, we're running out of summertime. So retrobriting stuff in the winter or fall is pretty hit and miss. Now, back in the day, I used my blue box for internal retrobriting, but that thing's been dismantled for quite a while. So I could try to revive that to do the top cover well, and the keys and things like that. Um, but it's not ideal for really large things. It's better for smaller stuff. If you happen to know a place I can pick up a replacement MMU chip, uh, put a comment down below or drop me a note in my email so I can get one ordered. And I guess uh, that's gonna be it for now. So I wanna thank all my patrons who are supporting the channel. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen now. I, a huge thank you to all of them. It's amazing the support I'm getting, especially in light of YouTube revenues being so low lately. And then if you like this video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up, you know, all the YouTube stuff, hit subscribe, and don't check, don't forget to check out my second channel, which has interesting videos. I like to think they're interesting at least, and hit sub over there if you don't mind as well. So that is gonna be it. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.